So for those of you who still read newspapers these days, it can induce somewhat of a non-alcoholic related uh, hangover. Similarly, if you look around your neighborhood and conduct an environmental scan, it can leave a public health advocate a little bit frustrated, perhaps even angry, but certainly feeling powerless in a sometimes hostile public health universe out there. Now this morning, Emily Halubowicz will guide and counsel us, sharing some tips about how to turn all that negative energy into effective strategies. Now is that something you need or what? So Ms. Halubowicz is a frequent speaker nationally about how to shape, uh, how to shape health destiny in Washington, D.C. That is not an easy task. She's a senior vice president for CRD Associates and has been lobbying on behalf of health and related public health concerns for several years, although she doesn't look like she could be doing that. <laughs> she will share with us how, how a well-informed perspective, her well-informed perspective, and offer tools and approaches to help attain the previously thought unattainable, getting your message across to an audience not that interested in public health. <laughs> Emily? Thank you. Wow, what a great introduction, Les. Thank you so much. Um, it's such a pleasure to be back. I was here last summer, um, and it's always nice to be invited back, because then I know I didn't offend anyone um, in my last talk. So I'm glad you all thought I did well. And as we are preparing for this, and speaking with Les, um, we thought, you know, a lot of things have changed uh, since I last met you in the summer. Um, a lot of things have not really changed, uh, so it might be helpful to sort of review um, where we are now and what has happened since, um, and again, review some of the strategies uh, for breaking through and what often feels like a very um, dark and bleak time, uh, since the name of my talk, The Dark Age Continues. Um, strategies for surviving austerity and moving toward the light. Um, and before I begin, I have to give a plug for my Twitter account, at Health Funding. So if you're interested in knowing what's going on with the budget and appropriations and public health in general in Washington, feel free to follow me. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, Vinny and the team at the National Network for Public Health Institutes, uh, who is a member of my Coalition for Health Funding. I serve as the Executive Director um, and we are a coalition of almost 100 national organizations across the discretionary health continuum uh, from scientists and public health professionals to healthcare providers and patients um, working to fight against this era of austerity. And they've been a wonderful partner for several years. So what I'll cover today, um, before we get into strategies, I think it's important to sort of lay some of the groundwork in the context for the current environment, both politically and fiscally. Um, I'm going to review what I see as some of the opportunities and challenges in Washington um, and talk about uh, some survival strategies, um, namely being as vocal as you can possibly be. Um, my talk focuses, again, I focus at the federal level, so my perspective is largely based on my interactions with policymakers at the federal level. Though I think a lot of the, the themes that I'll talk about when I'm talking about the minds of policymakers um, really translate both to uh, state and local elected officials as well. And some of the strategies that I'm going to share are, would even be helpful to you in your own department. If you're in a health department, I know sometimes it can feel really frustrating just to convince people higher up that what you're doing is important um, and in need of more resources and attention. So hopefully you can use these strategies in your day-to-day -day work as well um, as working uh, and trying to communicate to a broader policy making and even public audience. So since I last saw you, um, things look very different in Washington. Obviously the Senate flipped, uh, pretty much a landslide across the board. Um, this shows you the states uh, where uh, people were elected in the midterms. The gray states, those are states that were not um, up for re-election in the Senate. Um, and the dynamic has essentially flipped. We now have uh, 54 Republicans in the Senate, uh, 44 Democrats, two independents who are both caucusing with the Democrats. Um, that's compared to 2014 in the 113th Congress, 
when we have 53 Democrats, uh, two independents that caucus with the Democrats, and 45 Republicans. So almost exactly reverse. Uh, and then what's interesting is you look at the map of who's up for election in uh, 2016 in the Senate, um, you'll find that there are many, uh, we call them blue state Republicans, those states that voted pretty overwhelmingly for President Barack Obama in the last election, um, that were elected in 2010 in the last sort of Republican wave um, that are now up for re-election in 2016. That's a really interesting dynamic in the Senate um, because they're representing more moderate states. And so it means they themselves have to be a little bit more tempered and moderate if they hope to be re-elected in 2016. And I'll talk more about what that means for the overall policy dynamic. Um, the House probably won't surprise you. Um, it's really red. Um, and if you, if you look at this map really closely um, and you pay attention to the districts, you'll know they look very interesting um, as a result of really gerrymandering, probably not surprising, both uh, for Republicans and for Democrats. Um, so in the election, uh, the House Republicans uh, expanded their majority uh, to 247 members. Um, now one, uh, probably if you're reading, Aaron Schock has resigned. Um, so that seat uh, will be open. Um, we have 188 Democrats, uh, so they lost seats. That's compared to 233 Republicans in, in the 113th Congress and 299 Democrats. Um, I think I reversed this, sorry, <laughs> um, with three vacancies. What's interesting about this map um, is that when you look forward in terms of Democrat, uh, demographic shifts, and really the, the 2020 census and what that's gonna mean for the changes in, in the population's demographics um, is that we might expect to th see things start to shift. However, um, because of the way uh, districts are drawn, essentially at the state level, um, we might expect to see not many shifts and even more gerrymandering going forward. And David Wasserman, who's with the Cook Political Report, um, has done some analyses on this, sort of projections, looking at um, how things may play out. And he actually predicts that the House uh, will be in Republican control essentially for a generation. That um, in the same way the Democrats were in, in control of the House for a generation, we would see, say the same thing now with Republicans. He also says that um, for the presidency, the demographics are such that um, we would see Democratic presidents pr winning pretty handily um, for the next several elections, which is interesting, and probably seeing the Senate continue to flip back and forth. Um, well, I won't be talking about state politics uh, much today, but I think this is important as it particularly relates to the Affordable Care Act. Um, this is the gubernatorial map and the way things look. We now have 31 Republicans, 18 Democrats, and one independent governor from Alaska. Um, in 2014, 29 Republicans and 21 Democrats. Um, so things are looking um, pretty red across the board, and you say I don't have a map for it, but the same would be true for the state legislatures as well. So for folks that care about public health, which generally tends to be more appealing to Democrats and those of more um, liberal uh, persuasions, this can be a little terrifying. Um, I will say, and, and when you look at sort of the American populace overall and their political beliefs, and, and it shouldn't surprise you that Congress is a microcosm of this, our nation is more polarized than it has ever been. Um, when you look at polling of Americans who vote, um, and as you look over time over the last decade, where you see these two sort of humps, one red, one blue, that overlapped pretty significantly in that purple area, they are now almost completely apart. Um, that presents an interesting dynamic. Um, the same is true in Congress. When you look at bipartisan votes on legislation, they are at their lowest levels um, in many, many years. Um, so things are very polarized. Um, and what that means, it creates gridlock. And so really, kind of as we look at this landscape, I know a lot of my colleagues were freaking out after election. Oh my God, what are we gonna do? Um, my prediction is there's actually uh, probably minimal change um, in the next two years uh, for several reasons. One, we are already, if you haven't noticed, in a presidential election cycle. It's hard to get things done in a presidential election cycle. 
Um, and also, uh, just the dynamics of particularly um, the way our party structure is in government right now, where we still have a Democratic president. Um, we have a Senate where we do not have a supermajority. They need Democrats in order to pass really any bills. Um, and that in history, historically, interestingly, the most productive Congresses have been in years where the, uh, the power structure is split between the parties, where you have a, one party in control of Congress and one party in control of the White House. It pulls people to the center and forced compromise. Um, as we are seeing already this year, um, and again with the high stakes election uh, for the president in 2016, I think that this year may be an anomaly in breaking that trend of productivity. <laughs> and sometimes, um, as the founding fathers intended, lawmaking is supposed to be deliberative, it's supposed to be hard, um, and it's not supposed to move quickly. So this is really, in a way, as the founding fathers have intended, and in, in some respects, um, can be very beneficial to the, a lot of uh, the programs we care about. While it means certainly no forward progress, it also means we're not seeing um, decimation in a lot of the policies and programs that we care about. What we may see, um, obviously, probably you've noticed uh, the, the rhetoric around the Affordable Care Act has started to change somewhat and soften. Um, we now have 12 million Americans uh, of who were previously uninsured um, with insurance, give or take. Um, that's a lot of people, and a lot of those people are in red states. Um, so that pr presents an interesting dynamic um, for Republicans who have consistently advocated for repeal. We've now softened, talk more about replace, a replacement strategy. Um, I think we could see potential for repealing certain pieces of the Affordable Care Act, ones that have bipartisan support, such as the medical device tax, um, the independent, independent Payment Advisory Board, which is meant to um, essentially make decisions on what's worthy of coverage and what is not. Um, probably wouldn't surprise you that neither of those are po very politically appealing. Um, they, the medical device tax in particular will cost a lot of money to repeal, so that may prevent it, but there is bipartisan support in both chambers for both of these repeals. There is a replacement strategy um, that is starting to take effect, uh, both in the House and Senate. Um, Senator Hatch, who chairs the Finance Committee, has introduced kind of a framework called the Patient Care Act. Um, it would probably not surprise you that these strategies focus on really the core of the Affordable Care Act, which is coverage, um, and would maintain a lot of the um, provisions of the Affordable Care Act that relate to um, no discrimination based on pre-existing conditions, no lifetime limits. It would, of course, get rid of a lot of the provisions that make that possible, like the, the individual mandate and the employer mandate. Um, and certainly wouldn't surprise you that in these replacement strategies, a, a lot of the other things that relate to health um, are not included, such as the Prevention and Public Health Fund, which really since its enactment has become a safety net of funding for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we have seen lots of threats to the Prevention and Public Health Fund over recent years, um, although I think it's encouraging that the most imminent threat that I could have seen, which has been a, an actual threat to the Prevention Fund in the past, that is patching uh, payments for Medicare physicians, uh, the SGR or the doc fix, you may hear a lot about this in the coming weeks. Um, really seems we kind of dodged a bullet there. Uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner are actually negotiating a, a deal right now that would permanently fix the SGR. Uh, it is only partially paid for, which may ultimately uh, thwart its progress. But none of those pay-fors uh, directly rely on the Prevention and Public Health Fund, as opposed to a couple years ago when we patched the SGR fix uh, for 10 months, it cost $6 billion and they used prevention and public health fund dollars to pay for it. Interesting that it takes 10 years, six worth of prevention money um, and $6 billion to pay for 10 months of <coughs> Medicare physician payments, but um, nonetheless. Um, the down part to this deal is that part of the pay for is extending uh, sequestration, I'm gonna talk more about that, but sequestration is essentially cuts to spending um, 
sort of mostly sort of across the board. Um, it would extend sequestration for uh, into 2025 for mandatory funding that would include the prevention of public health fund. So every year, because of sequestration, as long as it's in effect, about $70 million comes off the top of the prevention of public health fund that otherwise could have gone to public health and prevention activities. Um, but it can always be worse. So I will take that as a positive. Um, nonetheless, uh, I think you'll see a lot of symbolic votes. You'll see a lot of pontificating about changing the Affordable Care Act. Um, but at the end of the day, um, the, the Republicans' uh, majority, uh, I think, will have very little chance of moving anything forward. Um, they have no supermajority in the Senate. They don't have 60 votes um, to move most measures that they'd like to move. The White House, of course, still has the veto pen. Um, and the House and the Senate still lack the votes to override um, any veto. So um, most likely new change, no change. The wild card here is um, the Supreme Court decision on King v. Burwell, which is a, a looking at the constitutionality of the subsidies for those buying uh, insurance through the exchanges. And um, depending on that decision, it could uh, later this summer really throw Washington into upheaval about now what do we do about it. So if they rule in favor of King that the subsidies are unconstitutional, um, estimates are that seven million people who've now just bought insurance won't be able to afford it anymore because they won't be able to receive the subsidies. Um, that could provide an opportunity for change to the Affordable Care Act. And, and Republicans are really counting on this, and this is really what's driving a lot of the uh, movement toward a replacement strategy. Um, and I'll talk more about the, the um, procedural maneuvers that they have to go through that. Um, but again, we've even heard that HHS uh, is developing a backup plan, um, a way to get those states who did not uh, uh, develop their own exchanges and are relying on healthcare.gov to continue to do so, and that is to essentially treat the, the federal government as a contractor, um, to contract with the federal government to allow their citizens access to hhs.gov, and that would thereby allow their um, constituents to continue to receive subsidies. So it's going to be a very interesting summer, um, and certainly into the fall. That said, um, with any new Congress, there's new opportunity. Um, we have new leadership essentially on all the key health committees, um, both appropriating and authorizing, and that is a great opportunity to educate um, and inform uh, their decisions, uh, particularly those members who are new to Congress, all those new freshmen who may not know yet what they don't know. So that's the political dynamic. On the fiscal dynamic, um, I know today I heard from Larry, um, our AV uh, support, that today's the International Day of Happiness. Um, so my talk is sort of a downer. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, there's not much I can do about it. So um, here's where we are. So federal government, um, probably if you've seen me speak before, I always use this slide. I think it's really important to provide some perspective um, of the almost uh, 3.4 uh, $4 trillion our federal government spends every year. About two-thirds of that is on mandatory spending. That includes entitlements, but not just entitlements, as well as our interest on the debt. And about a third is discretionary. And that discretionary piece is split up between the Department of Defense and non-defense programs, which are NDD, non-defense discretionary. Essentially, that is everything the federal government does that isn't defense, it isn't providing benefits. So. That would be this block here. So about 17%. And this little sliver that's kind of sticking out at 1.61% is what our federal government spends on an annual basis on discretionary health programs. This includes CDC, HRSA, SAMHSA, FDA, Indian Health Service, Administration for Community Living, um, and uh, the National Institutes of Health. So it's not a lot of money. Um, so we are doing a lot with not very much. Um, and about half of this 1.61% is the National Institutes of Health um, with a budget of about 31 billion-ish dollars. Um, under current austerity measures, if nothing changes, this is what spending looks like in 2022. 
Um, you'll see the 11%, we've gone from 17% to 11% in non-defense discretionary spending. Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security spending is expanding. Our interest on the national debt has practically doubled, which tells me a lot of these austerity measures are, well, reducing deficits in the short term, aren't doing much to address our long-term deficit debt. That's where this comes in. Um, and what this means, so picture our piece of the pie, which is already austere and already pretty small, shrinking even more. Um, what this graph does not capture is that within that 11%, there are programs that function like entitlements, but are actually counted in this NDD piece of the pie, namely veterans health benefits and Pell Grants, um, both of which can increase every year. Certainly we're seeing the same growth in healthcare spending in the VA sector as we are in other healthcare sectors. Um, and Pell Grants, it depends, kind of spending has been very high for the last several years during the recession, which is what you might expect. People have less income, more people qualify for Pell Grants, more people are going back to school. Um, but this is not a pretty picture. Um, and it means things, if we don't do anything, are about to get worse. And I think this uh, graph really tells it, in a thousand words in one picture, that if we do nothing on non-defense discretionary spending, again, which is where we find health and research, um, is on track to be at its lowest level as a percentage of our GDP or our overall economy since 1962. Um, and the only reason we have 1962 as that endpoint is that's as far back as the data go. So it's actually likely we're probably spending less than that. Um, you can see the historical average is about 3.8%. This year in 2016, we're hitting our previous low point as a percentage of GDP. And then we're going to be seen at levels never seen. Um, at least in modern history, which is pretty sobering. So what does this mean for public health? Um, federal cuts have been about 11% adjusted for inflation since 2010, um, but there is wide variation across the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, we see that for the outliers, uh, CDC and HRSA have been cut by 16% and 25% respectively. Um, in sequestration, when it first hit in 2013, that was the only year in which sequestration was across the board. We saw $2.5 billion cut in public health um, and a $219 million cut to CDC. As you all know, not all these cuts are created equal. Um, some programs were eliminated completely. Um, some programs maybe only had a slight haircut, um, but all in all, a not a good environment for health funding. Um, this graph just shows you sort of pictorially what this means, um, and you could see the, across the principal agencies of the public health service um, how things are looking. Slight increase at FDA, again, this is just for inflation. Of course, FDA's um, mission has expanded substantially um, in these last few years, um, so any increases they've seen in their base budget have not um, been commensurate with their new scope of activities that they see in food safety, tobacco regulation, and others. Um, Indian Health Service, again, a small increase, certainly not keeping pace with healthcare costs um, and providing care for that particularly vulnerable health population. Okay, so now I'll be positive. I think there are some opportunities uh, for public health in the current environment. Uh, first, and this is probably particularly relevant to NNPHI, there is intense interest both among Republicans and Democrats in understanding the impact of the Affordable Care Act on population health um, and that intersection of health care and public health and where do we draw the boundaries, how do we re redefine the boundaries, who gets to do what now under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and this is relevant for really all those wraparound services that for many years have been provided through public health Ryan White, maternal and child health, and cancer screenings, even immunizations. Um, all of this is uh, really driven by an assumption that, well, now that the Affordable Care Act is covering 12 million more Americans, has all these preventive services, we don't need this funding in public health departments anymore. We can either redirect that to other programs or we can just put that back into the treasury for savings, putting toward our deficit and our debt. Um, 
These decisions are being made often without any evidence. Um, and so it's why it's really important to continue to study and understand what impact are we really having um, and where are the gaps? Because as you know, the Affordable Care Act even um, on its best day isn't covering all America's uninsured. There's still people falling through the cracks um, and there's important safety net responsibility there for public health. Um, but we need that evidence and we need it to be communicated now. Um, probably no surprise, infectious diseases are hot right now. They continue to be on Capitol Hill. Certainly um, with Ebola here last fall, heightened the awareness of the importance of a core public health infrastructure and surveillance. Um, expect to see this year continued monitoring of that, uh, no pun intended, continuing monitoring of the response to Ebola overseas, as well as probably oversight hearings about the Ebola supplemental funding um, that was provided uh, toward the end of last year um, to help combat uh, the epidemic overseas. Um, the, the big issue right now that everyone is talking about is antibiotic resistance. About estimate 23,000 Americans die every year from uh, superbugs that can't be cured. I, I remember Dr. Frieden talking about this to advocates last year and what really struck me and resonated, again it goes to the power of kind of um, stories and simple language, he said picture having a urinary tract infection you can't cure. You can't get rid of it, um, which struck fear into my heart. Um, but that is really gaining traction on Capitol Hill. Um, it, the president himself, it was very interesting this year when the president released the budget request, he always puts out sort of teasers in advance of the budget of a couple key priorities that are really important. In recent history, it's dealt mostly with the economy, jobs, job training, um, science and innovation. This year, antibiotic resistance was one of those three that he previewed. It's a $1.2 billion initiative that he's requested across multiple departments, including HHS, AG, VA, DOD, within HHS, across several agencies, including CDC, um, BARDA, the National Institutes of Health, and even ARC. Um, I was pleased to see ARC in there. Uh, the request for CDC is $264 million. His request uh, for this last year was $30 million. So this is a huge priority for the administration um, and one that is really gaining traction on Capitol Hill. I think again with the measles outbreak, um, vaccines and immunizations, it kind of goes back to that, the integration of healthcare and public health. That's gonna continue to be a hot topic. It's been encouraging for me to see even on social media and on Capitol Hill an anti-anti-vax movement kind of taking shape um, and this idea of personal responsibility and you know it's, it's my choice if I want to vaccinate my child while other people saying well then you're not giving me a choice what about my choice to keep my child safe and you're putting my child at risk so it's a really interesting dynamic that's taking place again I think it's good to have that conversation about public health and really encouraging I think in particular when you saw, um, a, I don't know if you're paying attention, maybe it was a month or so ago, a lot of the Republican presidential candidates sort of came out and said, well, you know, it's a, per it's a person's choice, it's an individual choice. And other Republicans started running away from that pretty quickly and saying, no, no actually it's not. Um, and then they started backpedaling. So really interesting dynamic. Of course, then there was the new um, senator who talked about not washing your hands, but th that's a whole different thing. I'm like, really? We're debating hand washing now? Is this a thing? Um, <laughs> God. But anyway, um, <laughs> but you notice a theme here infectious diseases. Um, I'm going to talk more about that. Um, behavioral health, uh, similarly hot. Right after people talk about antimicrobial resistance, they talk about opioid abuse. Um, part of what's driving this is um, people on it, powerful Republicans in very powerful places are in states that are heavily affected by this. Um, heroin deaths in a small community make front page news. They're getting calls from their constituents. They're hearing about it every single day. They want to do something about this. Um, and I think that this is one area, and not just talking about law enforcement, but talking about how do we prevent it from happening? What are the public health implications? And really recognizing that this is a national epidemic. That is huge um, and a really great opportunity for us. And finally, I think uh, rural health, again, looking at that map, that red map, there's a lot of rural in that area. And there are a lot of policymakers who are very concerned about, are we reaching um, our constituents? Are they, now let's assume they have insurance, are they able to access care? 
Are they able to access those preventive screenings? Again, that's a place where maybe it's not, I can't make it to the doctor, but I can make it to my local health department. These are all important questions um, around rural health. I would include in rural health, tribal health as well. Um, and of course, as part of that, telemedicine. So challenges. Um, sequestration, we've had some relief in 2014 and 2015. So some of it, uh, its effects have been really masked in the last couple of years. We've actually seen some increases in public health um, over these last two years. It returns in 2016 if Congress doesn't do anything. Um, as I mentioned, that deal that was negotiated by uh, Paul, Mar Paul Ryan and Senator Patty Murray, who were then chairman of the House and Senate Budget Committees, respectively, um, is expiring. It means that in 2016, when you adjust for inflation, the levels are 17% below where they were in 2010 for non-defense discretionary programs. And that's the pot in which we compete with education, infrastructure, housing, energy, environment, uh, social services, um, and everything else on that non-defense discretionary side. Um, unfortunately, right now, just this week and into next week, the House and Senate are debating the budget resolutions. Neither of them provides any relief for sequestration. Um, in this year, they hold it flat for non-defense discretionary spending. And while it doesn't really matter because the budget numbers are only really applicable to this year, it is a 10-year budget. And so what do they do to get to balance the budget in 10 years? They slash non-defense discretionary spending in future years. Um, in the House by 20, and they extend it. So by 2025, um, the levels would be about 14% below where they are now. So picture, we're now at 17% below 2010. We'll be another 14% below that in 2025. In the Senate, we're seeing a similar cuts, not as deep, 4% below where we are now by 2025. Um, and what this means is sort of that the president's budget is good and bad for public health. Um, it, it's good in that, in fact, I think maybe for the first time in this administration, it actually had an increase for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which is very encouraging. Again, a lot of that driven by the um, Combating Antibiotic Resistance Initiative, or CARB. Um, the challenge here, uh, also $50 million for uh, opioid abuse at CDC prevention. Um, the problems here is what made that possible is the president's budget assumed that we would fix sequestration, um, adding back in about $37 billion to non-defense discretionary spending. So that's a lot of money to play around with um, for research and public health and other sectors. Um, it also had some pretty deep cuts in the budget, even within CDC. Elimination of the preventive services block grant, the prevent block, um, deep cuts in immunization funding, which probably not great timing um, given the measles outbreak, so they're, they're getting some pushback on that. Um, and in part, this is a game, right? They know for the President's budget has eliminated the preventive services block grant for the last, I don't know, two, at least two years, maybe longer. Congress always puts that money back in. Um, it, it's in some ways gimmicky whenever you're writing a budget to cut things that you know will never fly in Congress, just kind of make your numbers work. Um, and so, but that, those are the assumptions underlying a lot of these big increases that we're seeing on the health side of the ledger. Um, so what this means really, for, particularly for this year, the short term, there is zero sum gain going forward. Um, the best we can hope for, I think, is holding things where they are. Um, the sequestered 2016 level, as I mentioned, provides no room for growth. It is probably going to necessitate cuts. Um, the levels are not keeping pace with inflation. They're not keeping pace with population growth. They're certainly not keeping pace with the new and emerging challenges that we're facing in public health and other sectors. Um, so there's not a lot of room for new, and we're probably going to see cuts. It's interesting because I read an article yesterday that this is sort of what um, appropriators in Congress who know better, who've been trying to do this for a long time, been doing it for a long time, and the administration want. They want to put forward bills um, with levels that are so austere that it kind of forces those that are pushing for these austere levels to realize that this is really hard. Um, everyone's for cutting the size of government until you actually have to be accountable for voting to do it. Um, and it makes people really uncomfortable. We've seen this happen in the past on a transportation and housing bill a couple years ago where they brought the bill to the floor and it collapsed. They couldn't get support for it because 13% cut essentially. 
below um, what they were looking at. So I think some are looking and saying that the dynamic that's created by trying to pass appropriations bills in this environment is gonna set us up for a deal in the fall where we were able to have like a Murray Ryan type bipartisan sequestration patch, put some money back in the pot and pass bills probably right before the holidays. So my holidays will be wonderful again. Um, what's really interesting about the budget debate this year, probably more so than the funding, um, is a procedural mechanism called budget reconciliation. Reconciliation is essentially instructions that are given through the budget resolution to the policy writing committees to enact policy change. So it's, and it's giving them a, a sort of a hard stop to do that. Um, and the reason they wanna meet that deadline is that because under reconciliation, you don't need 60 votes in the Senate. You only need 51. And remember those 54 Republicans are not able to get the 60 they need to have any repeals to the Affordable Care Act. So there's a big debate right now, actually, that's being driven by the defense hawks who are saying the cuts to defense are too deep in the budget and I'm not gonna vote for it. Um, you have a block of conservatives who are saying I'm not gonna vote for it because it's not cutting enough. We need to keep these levels in place. And we're setting up a dynamic under which next week you're gonna wanna really watch where they may not be able to pass their own budgets. Um, this is something they have slammed the Democrats on for many, many years. Uh, it's gonna be very interesting to see what happens next week, but what may ultimately drive their determination and probably what leadership is selling them on in voting for the budget, it's not about the funding levels, it's about reconciliation and repealing and replacing the Affordable Care Act. Um, the timing of which is expected to sort of coincide shortly after the Supreme Court hearing uh, decision on King uh, v. Burwell. Um, and so this is definitely something to watch and probably gonna be the most interesting thing going forward over the next few months. So what does this mean? Um, really, probably no surprise to you, this really is becoming the new normal. Um, you've been working under austerity so long, it's hard to remember what it was like before. Um, it means there's fierce competition, I would underscore bold, fierce, uh, for limited resources. And what it means is we're setting up a dynamic where policymakers are forced to choose between what they see as a must do versus a, well, that would be nice to do if we had the resources, but we don't. Um, what makes keeps me up at night is this idea of a sort of cannibalization of public health. So as you look at those where I see as opportunities for public health, um, mostly on the infectious disease side. Um, so I fear that this sort of idea about focusing on what's core to public health, disease, infectious disease control and prevention, um, will be paid for uh, at the expense of funding for um, interventions on the non-communicable, non-infectious disease side of public health. It means that what is doing right uh, isn't really enough anymore. Um, everyone thinks what they do is the right thing or they wouldn't be doing it. Um, you need evidence uh, to show that what you're doing is working, to show that you're having an impact. This does not necessarily mean return on investment. Um, many of you have heard me talk about this before, so I won't go into it too much. Um, but reframing and just thinking about, am I, is what I am doing working? Am I having an impact? And you may be saving money, and that's wonderful, um, but you, pro you may not, and you may be netting zero, and maybe it's costing money, but if you're improving health, that should be the primary goal and what really matters. So showing that evidence, showing that impact is critically important right now. Um, you also have to remember, and I'll, I'll get more into this as we talk about the minds of lawmakers, but uh, politics often trump policy. Things happen that just often don't make sense. Um, Congress tends to respond to crises. Um, they're pretty good at that, waiting, procrastinating until the last minute or until they're forced to confront something. Um, they're making tough choices uh, and we essentially at a point now, it, particularly in health, we've trimmed the low-hanging fruit. There isn't a lot left to say, oh, we can get rid of that, oh, that's waste, oh, you know, we can consolidate these programs. We've done a lot of that. Um, so there are gonna be some tough choices and some tough cuts that we're gonna be facing coming up. Um, some of these decisions will probably not make much sense. I know there was a lot of kind of confusion a couple years ago when the community transformation grants, which are working, suddenly became 
pitch grants and they're restructured and they have a new name and it's like, why did this happen? It had nothing to do with policy, it was politics. It was, what do we need to do to save the prevention fund? And what do we need to do um, to get Republicans off our backs about bike paths and jungle gyms? And that, it was purely political. Um, and that happens. And it's something that we just have to be very aware of and try not to let ourselves get discouraged by that as we go forward. So what do we do? I think the first step, I know people, we do a lot of webinars and talks about communications. The first step in communicating is like actually communicating. We cannot afford to sit on the sidelines um, and talk amongst ourselves and be sad. Why doesn't anyone like us? Why don't we get more money? It's because we're not, we're not making any noise. I'm telling you right now, I, I just look at the last couple weeks. I mean, if you, if you want a great model for how to do this, you look at the patient community and the National Institutes of Health. Um, just in the last week, there were at least five Hill Days that I know of, of patient groups flying in hundreds of patients suffering from disease, and every single one of them talked about NIH. Um, just to the point that there was an interesting article from uh, Sam Stein at the Huffington Post just this week about an event that Stand Up for Cancer held on Capitol Hill, and they had several Tea Party folks in there saying, we need to double the NIH. No, not double. We need $80 billion for NIH. And it was the community stunned. It's like, wow, this is not what you would expect to be hearing from conservatives. Um, but it's because they're hearing from people. And they're convinced. And they see the value because they're hearing about it every day. We've got to get off the sidelines. And that means not advocacy. Um, so I think we all, oh, I can't talk about it. It's advocacy. It's not necessarily advocacy. If you are receiving public dollars, federal, state, local, you're a steward of those taxpayer dollars, you need to be transparent and you need to be accountable about how you're spending the money, what you're doing with it, and is it working? Are the taxpayers getting what they paid for? That is critically important. And if you don't fill that void of that narrative and share those stories and talk about what you're doing with the money, policymakers are gonna make up the narrative themselves in an information vacuum. Um, that's how, well, how we ended up with the Obamacare slush fund. Uh, I'll talk about never repeating negative language, but to talk about the prevention of public health fund, they see a headline, they see a title of a grant, and they make assumptions. Um, and that's why we need to be out there communicating um, and educating all the time, and not just at the federal level, state and local level. Um, I know this makes a lot of people nervous, but it may surprise you, policymakers actually want to hear from you. They want information. They don't want to make decisions blindly. Um, they do sometimes rely on evidence. Um, so it's important that you are giving them that information. And they actually want it. It may surprise you. And I know that sometimes, again, you look at the, the red map and it sort of strikes fear into the hearts of um, lots of liberal folks in public health. But at the end of the day, I think public policymakers at any level and public health professionals have a lot more in common than we think. We want to do the right thing. We want to be responsible stewards. We want to make people's lives better. We want to make our communities better. So if you've ever read Getting to Yes, um, the authors talk a lot about, in, in terms of starting a negotiation or starting a discussion, looking at your shared interests and your common ground. Um, as far as common ground goes, that's a really good place to start. Um, and it's something to keep in the back of your mind, even as you're headed into those offices where you're like, oh God, I know this is gonna be the worst meeting of my life, um, that you're both coming from a place of wanting to help. Um, you may have very different ideas about how to do that and how to get there, and that's okay, but keeping that in the back of your mind can be very important. Um, in so doing, and I'm gonna talk about this when we talk about communications tips, it's not about you, it's not about what you think is important, it's about what they want and what they see as important. You need to speak to them um, and not just re reinforce the messages that we all tell ourselves and we talk about at these meetings. You have to reframe how you think about what you do um, to make it important in their eyes. So what are policymakers? I, it's funny, I hadn't thought of this before, it just struck me the other day. I've been watching American Horror Story, so I'm like thinking about circuses. Um, but they really are, I think at any level, policymakers are like circus performers. Um, not to apply, they're clowns. Although sometimes it feels like a clown car on Capitol Hill. Um, they are playing to the crowd all the time. First and foremost on their minds all the time are their constituents, what their constituents want, what their constituents think. 
Um, they are in the spotlight. If you can picture being literally in a 24 hour me media cycle, always on, always cameras recording what you say, always taking pictures of your, you think about that and living in that environment um, and what that would do to your psyche, it is very challenging. It's also, I think, because of this 24 media, hour media cycle, you're always running for re-election. It never ends. Um, so making hard decisions, even if you think they're in the best interest of your constituents, if your constituents are saying they don't want it, don't tell me how much soda I can drink, don't tell me to wear a seatbelt, even if you know it's the right thing to do, it's really hard to go against um, what your constituents want. It's sort of like being a parent. Um, it's really hard when your toddler's screaming um, to give them that lollipop, even though you know they shouldn't have it, but to just deal with that, the repercussions of putting your foot down is really, really hard. Um, they are jugglers. They are constantly juggling. They are juggling issues. They are juggling priorities. They are flooded with information. And as I mentioned, every single person that comes in to talk to them, their program is the most important. What they're doing is the most important. It's the most worthy. It's the best. And, and so how do you balance that? At some point, it's white noise. And it just all sort of cancels itself out. Um, they are at the mercy of the ringmaster, the ringmaster being your political party. Maybe your donors. Um, they're calling the shots. And at some, in some instances, you just have to toe the line. Even though you know it's not the right thing to do, and it may hurt your constituents, if it's what the party has decided is the right thing to do, you kind of have to play along. Because if you don't, and you get pinned as an outsider, you're not going to get the right committee assignments. You're going to be marginalized in the party. Um, you're not going to get the fundraising that the major party um, platforms are providing for you. So that's not a great place to be. Um, so you kind of go with the flow. Um, and finally, I think you are trying to put on a good show. You want to do the right thing amidst all these other challenges and pressures that you're facing um, that are put on you. Um, and so in that, I think before I talk about how to communicate, first and foremost is um, understanding where they're coming from, um, understanding these pressures, and actively listen. So sort of the first rule in communications, listen. Um, listen to what they're saying, listen by watching their body language, listen by visiting their Facebook page and seeing what their constituents are posting on there, visiting their Twitter feed, seeing how they vote, really understand what they're going through um, and try to be responsive to that um, in these conversations that you're having. Um, ask questions, probe them. I, I, I'm having trouble understanding why you feel that way. Or if I'm hearing you correctly, you're seeing this program as this, um, but let me try to explain to you how it really is. Um, so asking those questions, being responsive and actively listening is probably your best tool um, as a, a public health, I will say advocate, because I think we are all advocates. Um, sometimes it feels like this, probably, if you've ever, has anyone had interactions with policymakers before, show of hands, at any level of government? Okay, pretty much, yeah, good, good amount. It probably sometimes feels like this. And I think this is probably how policymakers feel. Oh my God, just stop asking me for things. Um, so how can we break through this? I think first, and you've probably all heard of the KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid. Um, I will try to, try to break this down. Um, you've all heard, make words shorter. Don't use jargon, don't use acronyms, don't use technical language. Um, and, and this is, I think, think pretty obvious, but the, the meaning behind this is pretty deep. And why you don't do this is because otherwise you're completely alienating your audience in two ways. First, um, when you start going down the, uh, the scientific meeting presentation panel of regression analyses and p-values, and you are they're not getting it. They're not understanding what you're saying. The, the message is being lost in all the technicalities of um, what we do, it also makes you the smartest person in the room. Um, and you may be, and that's okay, you're probably the smartest person in that room about public health, um, but that is not a good way to treat your audience. And what you're doing by being technical and trying to sound smart, I think some of us do this because we want to sound smart, because then we feel like we have authority, um, and they'll take us more seriously because now we're credible, when in fact, um, now you put them in a position where they are um, not in the position of power, where they feel inferior, they feel insecure, and that psychologically 
shuts them off from hearing what you're saying because they feel very uncomfortable. And if any of you know politicians or you work with politicians, they don't like to feel like they're not the smartest person in the room. So not a good way to go. Um, I think this is really, uh, oh, and I'll just note, so, and this is true, I think, even um, working with the media. So when you, if you think about media, because I, I would add um, they're just as busy as policymakers and facing as many pressures, but a great way to get the message about public health out to the public is through the media, and I, and I do a lot of work with the media, and a lot of what I do is taking these highly technical concepts and breaking them down or even just validating them for reporters. So reporters will call me and say, Emily, I'm trying to describe, um, we just did this the other day for my client, um, 60 Minutes did a piece on the death master file and all these errors in the death, ma death master file. And we work with them behind the scenes to talk about the state role in collecting vital records. And I can't tell you how many conversations we had about, Emily, we want to say this. Is this accurate? Because we're trying to distill this down. It's so com complex and so wonky and boring. How can we say this in a simple way, but it's still accurate at its base? And so um, as public health professionals, you can be a great resource to reporters, um, even just on background, to verify what they're saying and to help them say it in a clearer way. Um, anecdotes do matter. Um, I know this is surprising to a lot of people who work in science, um, but the standard of evidence for a policymaker is completely different than the standards of evidence for this type of audience, for a dissertation review panel, for a peer-reviewed journal article. Um, in fact, probably the highest value is placed on anecdotes, which is the opposite, right, in the scientific community. Um, so when you're talking to them about what you do and whether or not it's working, Focus on the people and experiences, not on the programs and procedures and the mechanics of what you're doing. Talking about the, the, the feelings, the impact, the, the ways in which you're changing people's lives. And the best way to do that is through stories and personal stories of that one person whose life you really changed. Um, you can visit cutshurt.org. This is something the Coalition for Health Funding has done um, to tell the story of austerity. Um, and the individual's experience with dealing with budget cuts and what that means um, has been pretty powerful and is actually, I think, um, a large reason why we were able to get this bipartisan deal to relief, uh, provide relief and sequestration. You've all heard about one-pagers. Um, a one-pager should be one page. It should augment your message, not be the principal deliverer of your message. Um, that means, essentially, if there are three things you want this person to take away from this meeting and remember, what are they? That's what you put on the one pager. Should be lots of white space, lots of big font, pictures, graphs, to an extent. I would not uh, propose putting on like a scatter plot, but gar bar graphs, pie charts, line graphs, these are all things that at a glance are very easy to understand and can help augment that message. Um, and you want to choose your words wisely. I think some of you have heard me talk about this, that words do matter. Um, and how you talk about things to certain audiences, again, it goes to knowing your audience, um, is important. And uh, here's a list I just sort of threw up as I think about how different ways to talk about different things. Um, Frank Luntz, who's a, a Republican operative, is actually um, very brilliant in this regard and, that, uh, and does this very well. He tests words, um, pulls together focus groups, Tell me what you think about how we talk about this or how, how we talk about that. It's how, um, you know, we, you know, with their talking points around the Affordable Care Act, it, you know, people were afraid of the government getting between them and their doctors, so they used it. It's very smart, and none of us usually have the money to have these focus groups. Um, but in general, I mean, knowing about who you're talking to makes a difference. Um, I didn't even realize this, but <laughs> this actually happened to me where I was talking about population health and someone said, you mean, you mean population control? So you're in favor of abortion? I was like, what, what, what? <laughs> That's what I meant. Um, they don't know what population health is. They don't get it. Um, you would not want to walk into a, a Republican from the South's office and talk about gun control. Not gonna get through if that's what your message is, um, but they might talk to you about gun safety. Um, and really, the, I know this makes people feel uncomfortable and it doesn't feel genuine, but really it, the, the point is to enact policies that improve public health and to inform and educate. And if it means you have to speak their language to do it, um, you shouldn't feel bad about that. 
Um, similarly, global warming and climate change are actually really interesting studies about this. The, the reason we ended up talking about global warming is that climate change is more frightening to people. 80% of Americans are terrified of climate change. Global warming sounds less scary. So you've now, um, again, manipulated public perception um, just in the ways that you talk about things. Um, tax, any word with tax in it, bad for Republican office, but incentives, incentivizing behavior, choice, um, these are all things that really resonate. Um, I wanted to put this up there. I think we're going to share the slides, um, but at a very simple level, when you're talking to anyone about what you're doing, this is a great framework. I'm here today to talk to you about my program. We are making an impact, and you might want to provide some context there, um, define the problem. Um, we're trying to address this problem of obesity, so we are um, extending, uh, we found that we're extending the physical activity in our school, and we're making an impact by children being more engaged, test scores going up, insert your metrics here. Um, why does this even matter at a local level? Local, local, local. Um, it's important to your constituents because nationally we rank as one of the highest um, zip codes with obesity. Um, it is crushing our economy. Uh, this is where all the healthcare spending is, blah, blah, blah. And then let me tell you a story. So let me tell you a story about Jimmy. Jimmy was, had a, you know, was 30% overweight, he was um, not getting great grades in school, and by participating in this program, being more physically active, he is now, has more confidence, he's speaking in class, et cetera, et cetera. So tell that story. Um, also critically important is knowing when to reach out. So this is, again, at the federal level. Decisions about federal spending are happening right now. Um, this is uh, something I worked on with Academy Health, and this is available, available on academyhealth.org. Um, and it shows you the timeline of when are federal budgetary decisions made, um, who's making them, and when are the appropriate times to reach out. You'll see there's really only a very small window in which you want to start communicating both with um, policymakers in Congress and also policymakers in the administration. Some important homework. Um, I just read on the plane uh, the IOM Population Health Roundtable on communicating to advance the public health. If you haven't read it, I think you really should. Um, what was most interesting to me as they explored how to communicate about population health and social determinants of, of health was to actually not call it population health and social determinants of health, um, which sort of uh, reinforces my point that words matter. Um, getting to yes and getting past no are uh, manuals about negotiation and really discussions and breaking through uh, difficult conversations, I highly recommend. Um, the debunking handbook is, you can Google it and download, it's only seven pages, it's fascinating. Um, and it shows you the right and wrong way to change people's minds. Um, I know for many of us, we feel like facts, 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 facts. Throw more facts, the more facts the better, and in fact, um, that is the worst thing you can possibly do because the more facts you throw at some, someone, the more there's a backfire effect. And the behavioral science has found this, that they actually become more entrenched in their existing view and less receptive to new information about the way things really are. It's fascinating. Um, and finally, I, I talked about Frank Luntz, but I think uh, it's a little old now. It's probably about 10 years old, but words that work are still really relevant. So I probably talked too long. Um, here's my contact information. Hopefully, have we time for questions? No. We started late, so a little. I'll put this back up.